Well, I think we can start. It's right on time. Um, welcome back to the another session of ELS 2021. Um, this time we are going to have several invited lectures. Uh, they are uh, around the team of Michael Mishenko. I have to emphasize that all of us, probably everybody here, uh, uh, is aware of Michael Mishenko's contribution to these ELS conferences, as well as the light scattering community. So this session is very important in a sense that several people who have worked closely with Michael will be talking about their research and their impact, the Michael's impact on their research. The first lecture will be given by Ping Yang, the editor-in-chief of uh, uh, JQSRT. Uh, Ping, uh, are, you are there, right? Yes, I'm here. Yes, please start sharing your lecture. Thank you, Ping. I will turn myself off and I will let you know just two minutes before the end of your session, just to indicate your time is up, okay? So can you see the uh, screen? Yes, that's okay. He sees the screen. Okay. So, after Michael Mishanko's passing, uh, several colleagues uh, listed here uh, wrote a tribute to Michael. And the tribute has been published in the Bulletin of American Mineralogical Society. And it has also be um, posted on the uh, International Radiation Commission uh, webpage. This presentation is largely based on the article we uh, wrote it together. On July 21st, uh, 2020, we lost a good colleague and dear friend Michael Mishanko, a scientist at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. July 21st was um, Monday. Even two days before that, um, Saturday evening, I still got a, you know, um, two emails from Michael regarding the expansion of scattering phase metrics. Michael really enjoyed it, doing scientific research Indeed, he was an outstanding scientist until the very end. His contributions were uh, enormous, uh, including uh, more than 310 peer review papers, seven books, uh, 33,000 citations with an H index of 88. He contributed to light scattering theory in particular, the T matrix method and light scattering in you know, absorbing medium, radiative transfer theory, and uh, establishment of the physical optics content of the radiative transfer theory by deriving it directly from Maxwell equations, polarimetric remote sensing theory, and the applications for numinous services to the research community. So here are some books he wrote uh, in terms of the impacts of these books. You can see the citation numbers. You know, for example, the scattering, absorption, and emission of light by small particles has been studied more than 2,700 times. And so these two books are also highly cited. Here's a little bit of uh, academic background. So Michael received a uh, master's degree in physics from Moscow Institute 
uh, physics and the technology in 1983. PhD with honor also in physics, Ukrainian National Academy of Sciences in 1987. From 1987 to 1992, he was a senior scientist in Ukrainian National Academy of Sciences. In 1992, he joined uh, NASA, NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, first as a contract, uh, later on became a um, civil servant. He also had an adjunct uh, uh, upon appointment with Stony Brook. He received a number of awards and uh, Francois Arago Award in Plurimetric Remote Sensing and the Van der Hoes Award and uh, also a number of you know, NASA uh, awards including NASA Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal twice. So this is very pre prestigious award so each year, the agency uh, gives uh, several awards, including all the centers. So this is really, really a uh, prestigious award. And uh, he also got the uh, National Prize of Ukraine in Science and Technology. I saw it, you know, um, 22686 was named um, Mishanko. He was elected as a fellow of American Meteorological Society, uh, the fellow of the Institute of Physics, fellow of the Optical Society of America, fellow of the American Geophysical Union, and the NASA Performance Award uh, so many times, and the NASA GSFC Special Act Award uh, many, many times, and the Horton Award. Um, by, uh, MS. Michael made a significant contributions to the uh, T-Matrix method. The T-Matrix method was pioneered by Peter Waterman and their powerful technique for computing electromagnetic scattering by single homogeneous arbitrarily shaped particles. Michael discovered that the particle T-Matrix is a quantity independent of the incident and the scattered waves, and is fully determined by the particle geometry and the composition. Furthermore, the elements of the normalized scattering phase matrix can be expanded in terms of the generalized spherical functions, and there is a direct analytic relation between the expansion coefficients and the T-matrix. This relation allows an efficient analytic orientation average procedure that avoids the time-consuming numerical angular integration. For example, the extinction cross-section can be given by the summation of T-matrix elements. This is a significant contribution. Michael developed a you know, robust T-matrix method based computer codes for computer single scattering properties of sprite, finite circular cylinders, chip shift particles. These codes are public available and have been used by many researchers worldwide. You can see the uh, citation number, um, uh, about 900 um, citations uh, based on Google Scholar. Um, in the uh, last several years before his passing, he concentrated on light scattering and absorption by particles in an absorbing uh, medium. So he discovered there's a negative extinction efficiencies um, in these cases. You, know, you can see here, uh, extinction efficiency can be negative. So here I list you know, um, um, two papers. He also worked on the first principle analysis of effective medium approximation routinely used in remote sensing research to model optical properties of heterogeneous aerosol and cloud particles. 
besides clarifying the microphysical roots of these heuristic approximations, he was the first to prove definitely the existence of the effect medium scattering regime and establish its range of applicability using the most recent versions of the superposition T matrix method. Um, this is a review particle he published in physics reports. In 1995, uh, Michael derived a rigorous relation between the linear and the circular deposition ratios for randomly oriented Lanzberger aerosol and the cloud particles. This result is now widely considered to be among the most profound and consequential theoretical contributions to NIDAR research over the past three decades. It has been become central to the conceptual framework of dozens of industrial and biomedical patents. Um, this paper was published with uh, Hovenier. Michael um, performed a pioneer studies of the effects of phenomenological particle complexities on um, results in the radi radiative polarization, depolarization properties of mineral aerosols, fractal suit, and the suit containing aerosols, suit contaminated uh, cloud droplets, contrail particles, um, polar uh, stratospheric clouds. In 1997, he developed, he developed the radiative properties model of uh, minor aerosols represented by a size shape mixture of random oriented spheroids, which has become a widely accepted benchmark. This work was further extended by uh, Oleg Dubovic by incorporating uh, improved geometric optics master calculations for coarse mode particles. So this slide actually was given by Michael um, um, before his passing. What he's shown here is you know, really transfer um, in the field of physics. It's, it's a tiny island. And then you have a main island of physics. Suppose we should have a, you know, a bridge to connect the main land to the uh, island. So um, in this book, Mandel and Wolf, Emil Wolf wrote, in spite of the extensive use of the theory of radiated energy transfer, no satisfactory derivation of its basic equation from electromagnetic theory has been obtained up to now. So this uh, implies that although there should be a, a bridge on the current situations like this. So that motivates uh, Michael's research in this area. Michael solved the long-standing problem of establishing the actual physical orange of radio transfer theory, the foundation of remote sensing research. He demonstrated that inherently intentional uh, 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 nature of radio energy transport in aerosol and the cloud medium established the physical optics content of radiative transfer survey by deriving it directly from Maxwell equations. So micro research has served to rescue the phenomenological radiometry conceived by Buiger and Lambert long before they developed modern series of light matter interactions by place under the modern physics based uh, foundation. So all this work was published, um, as was summarized in, in a book published by uh, Michael uh, Never Travis and Inesis, Multiple Scattering of Light by Particles. In 1990s, in the uh, 1990s, Michael pioneered systematic physical based sensitivity analysis of entire hierarchies of tropospheric aerosol retrieval algorithm based on radiance 
as well as polarization measurements from space. His model decayed on global satellite climatology of aerosol mount and the size derived from model channel observations with NOAA AVHRR revealed that the complexity of short and long-term aerosol trend as well as immense complexity of retrieving requisite aerosol properties from space. Um, this uh, um, highly cited papers include a paper published in Science. From 1988 uh, to 2002, Michael served as a project manager for NASA GWX Global Aerosol Climatology Project. This program coordinates efforts of 33 research groups worldwide with the aim of improving the knowledge of aerosol properties related to aerosol direct and indirect effects on climate. Among the outcomes of this program were three scientific um, team meetings and a comprehensive special issues of the Journal of the Atmospheric Sciences. And this is the uh, preface of this special issue. He served as a project scientist for NASA Glory's uh, satellite mission from 2003 to uh, 2011. His responsibilities included scientific justification of the mission, formulation of the measurements requirements, justification of the instrument design, programmatic, uh, pro programmatic uh, publications, working with and reporting to NASA headquarters on all aspects of the mission, participation in numerous technical and scientific reviews of the mission, management of the global science team and its budget, organization of global science team meetings, representation of mission and conferences, and working with the media. Michael uh, also had a, a significant contribution to astronomy, and uh, his team metrics idea and the codes have been widely used for remote sensing of various type of cosmic dust and uh, especially you know um, his code you know uh, developed together with uh, Dan Mikoski was very very uh, useful for, for this field. Michael's series techniques and computation of polarized uh, bi-direction reflectance of planet particulate layers and rock surfaces is a significant contribution to the interpretations of ground-based and in-situ data of planetary atmosphere and surface, natural satellite surfaces and the surfaces of solar system small uh, bodies. And also he made a significant contribution to this start of a coherent uh, backscattering. All these contributions uh, were summarized in a book, uh, Polarimetric Remote Sensing of a Solar System Object, published in uh, 2010. This book received the state prize of Ukraine in the field of science and technology for 2011. Michael uh, also a uh, significant contribution uh, to the international applied optics, radio transfer, and the remote sensing communities. He was a topic editor of uh, applied optics from 2000 2006. He had been uh, editor in chief for many years uh, uh, for Journal of Quantitative Spectroscopy and Radiative Transfer. And he was uh, editor in chief of Physics Open. And he was a guest editor of 19 special uh, journal issues, editor for three monographs. He organized 10 major uh, remote sensing conferences, including six uh, EIS conferences and two NATO Advanced Study Institutes. He was a very kind person, always uh, supported his colleagues. In 2011, uh, Professor George Kalewa received the um, 
Texas Distinguished Scientist Award. So we had a celebration. So we called, you know, Michael. We said, oh, could you come down to Cal Station uh, to celebrate to celebrate with us without any uh, hesitation? He said, yes. He just flew down to Texas A&M, and we had a nice celebration. So here's Michael, uh, George Carlewa, and me. So Michael's groundbreaking uh, scientific accomplishments and the voluminous service to the international remote sensing and the radiated transfer community will continuously inspire us and the future generations of researchers, particularly in the disciplines of electromagnetic scattering, radiative transfer, and remote sensing. As a tribute to Michael's extraordinary scientific career, we would like to borrow the words uh, written by Nobel laureate Chandrasaka in his in our dedication to his role model or mathematical genius, uh, Ramanujan. It is hopeless to try to emulate him, but he was there, even as Everest is there. Thank you. Thank you, Pink. Uh, this was a very nice overview of what Michael has done. After this session, as you will all know, well, you'll see, we will have Michael Mishenko uh, medal winner announced. So, uh, but for the moment, I will not really wait for any questions because we are running out of time. Thank you, Pink. We can go to the next speaker. Uh, I think it's you, right, Maxim? Please start. Yes. In 15 minutes, I will let you know by turning my video on. Yes. Uh, so go good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it is for you. Uh, I will be talking on the feasibility of measure and extinction of single particles. And well, the topic is trivial at first glance. So basically you have energy conservation if some incident power is getting on the particle and some is transmitted. So the difference should be due to absorption and scattering. And this is commonly called extinction. So this simple concept works very fine when you try um, to measure it for a collection of particles. So you just put a detector here, uh, one moment. Uh, so put a detector here with particles and without particles, if you can get the difference, you get the total extinction by this collection. And it works fine due to relative displacement of the particle, which is usually random. Uh, also seems easy that the same can be done for single particles as shown here. It's a nice picture from Matthew Berg's article. Uh, but it has some issues. So it's not really that easy because um, as I will show further, extinction is a complicated interference phenomenon. And then you put a detector here and the intensity of this interference will depend on the transverse coordinate. And that's why the whole detector reading will depend on its size. Uh, this has been acknowledged um, in classical textbooks, both Van der Hulst and Born and Hoffman. Uh, so it, it was known that a detector should be fairly large. So this squared uh, radius should be much larger than wavelengths times the distance. And it also must be not perfectly circular. However, discussion in these textbooks is largely qualitatively, so it's kind of not completely satisfactory. Uh, I think uh, one of the first like quantitative analysis of this phenomena was performed by Matthew Berg for a uh, circular detector, and then uh, Michael Mishinka um, uh, got on this train. So he, he also contributed to analysis. So he proposed a square detector. And here you see the results, basically, uh, that we will further also analyze in more details. Uh, this picture showed that you have a very large distance to, to detector shown here, and then you increase the detector size. Again, very large distances. And if you have a circular detector, basically your reading does not converge. So the true value you expect for extinction is somewhere here, and you have wild oscillations around. Uh, and for square detector, you do have some convergence, but it's extremely slow. So that kind of precludes accurate measurement of extinction by this uh, simple uh, setup is shown here. 
Uh, so my goals uh, in this research and in this talk is to extend quantitative analysis to arbitrary shapes, uh, to account for particle movement, which may happen, and discuss required signal to noise ratio for measuring extinction if one want to try it. Uh, so the problem setting is rather trivial. Uh, so we have interference between spherical and plate waves in the far field. Again, a nice picture by Matthew Beck. Uh, and basically, you, you have this. There are some formulas here, but important is that we make reasonable approximations as uh, detailed here. And then we get into this uh, formula. So this delta i is the difference of detector reading between, well, it's not the whole detector reading by but intensity at certain point on the detector which uh, uh, which uh, well is a difference for when the particle is present and not present and here you see that uh, you have the scattering amplitude the incident field and then this term which become very important and we define this as eta for conciseness so if you want a total signal or total difference uh, signal by the detector we need to integrate it over the detector surface uh, we can do it in quite a general setting considering a star-shaped plane detector as shown here with some function uh, rho of theta so r would be like the largest ra radius and its total area is a uh, and well we can do this integration over rho then we left only with integral over theta so if we define it and we will analyze it further then our uh, reading uh, well th there should be no r here it just depends on uh, just the total difference intensity. Uh, so you have this expression. And this one, it corresponds to standard extinction. So if you remember a formula from Bowen Hoffman, it will it will just end here, the square bracket. That would be the extinction cross section. But here you have some correction. So uh, on nuisance parameter, you can call it. Uh, so let's analyze uh, this integral. Uh, first, if the radius is relatively small, sh shown here, then f is uh, not small at all. So it's actually close to one, and then this will be very different from the extinction that you uh, that you expect to see. Uh, then, uh, if it's odd of one, again you have some complex behavior irrelevant for the extinction, and we may only hope to get small f or goes to zero in the limit of fairly large detector size shown here. But again, immediate conclusion of this expression that you just see here, that if you have a circle, so rho is just constant, then this integral will trivially give you this. And that means that the answer will oscillate with uh, detector uh, area. It will be order of one. So then you will get this oscillation as you saw in numerical example before. Uh, and further to evaluate this f, we can actually consider the stationary phase method. Uh, well, for a particle like shown here, so it's kind of a smooth uh, function with some number of extrema. And then contribution from each this extremum in the stationary phase method will be given by this formula. Well, it's kind of more or less uh, exact, but not very convenient for use. Uh, well, first I know that you can also have a, a contribution from discontinuous of derivatives. For example, if you take a sphere, uh, not a sphere, a square, then you will have these sharp corners, but th those contributions are smaller. So they're order of one over eta, and these are order one over square root of eta. So we can neglect this. And for further analysis, we uh, introduce this measure of deviation from a circle. So that's basically a difference between maximum rho squared over the uh, particle bound, uh, over the detector boundary, and the minimum value. And then you can estimate the total integral, something like that. Uh, so, well, you have this simple expression where this uh, gamma is a measure of deviation and eta is uh, k squared over 2z. So then let us see on the implications. Uh, so first we consider some significantly non-circular detector like shown here or a square, for example. Then this gamma will be comparable to R squared. And that means that uh, this uh, correction integral F uh, would be of this order. 
And that means if you want it to be small, you need these to, to be satisfied. However, these need to be satisfied quadratically. And what I mean by that is that if you want uh, to have this correction of order 1%, then the difference between left and hand side here should be squared of that. So it should be like 10,000 difference. Uh, then again, you can apply it to, for example, a circular detector, but the particle is displaced here from the center. Uh, here, gamma is smaller, so it's not R squared, but uh, R times this, well, potentially small parameter, Y, and then, well, you have this equation. And actually, for this, you can get an elliptical expression, but it will give you the same order of magnitude as shown here. And then you can also get similar result for rough detector boundary. So it's more or less a general analysis, uh, but let us also include particle diffusion uh, for a circular detector. Uh, we just consider some diffusion, but the characteristic displacement, which is based by diffusion coefficient and some time of diffusion or time of measurement, uh, we assume that it's smaller than radius of the detector. And then, well, you can do some math and obtain the following expression. And if you want, again, this to be small, so this averaged value of f unit C, which is defined here, uh, to be much larger than one. And that means that this value should be much, also much larger than one, but as a square root. So it's by contrast to the previous case here to have this like 1%, it's sufficiently to have this number of order 10 or something, so not, not that large. Uh, looking at this, you may want to increase the diffusion so that the particle will spread over the larger part of the detector area or even go outside, but that's a bad idea because, well, if you consider it egoistly, then the main extinction term will differ. So you want the extinction term as shown before to stay the same. That's more or less the stationary point in two dimension that, that you have, but uh, then uh, only the uh, this correction f to decrease. So you can't really make uh, y not too large here. And this brings us to like some practical implications. So suppose you want to measure your extinction with 1% accuracy. So the main problem here that first you need what I call a good theoretical accuracy. Uh, what that means that uh, you do a a specified measurement of with a single detector, like with particle and without particle, and you want to dif the difference to actually correspond to extinction. And that means that all the previous, uh, well, these uh, kind of expressions uh, should be satisfied because otherwise the difference will just have a different theoretical expression. And this theoretical accuracy implies that you need to have large uh, detector size and also distance to the detector, as we show, as, as you saw also in numerical examples before. But that necessarily means that you will have small relative signals. So basically, your that your total intensity is proportional to detector area, and your well additional signal or decrease of signal that you measure is proportional to extinction cross section, which is more or less particle, uh, order of particle cross-section, at, at least if the particle is not smaller than, not much smaller than the wavelengths. Uh, and then, well, you can actually do some estimates. So for example, you have a non-circular detector and a fixed particle, and you see there are two expressions here. Uh, so this is for the theoretical accuracy, and this one involves uh, that the condition that angular size of your detector should be at least 10 times smaller than the first diffraction lobe. Otherwise, you would see not only forward scattering amplitude, but it will be significantly correct. And the problem is that here you have R and Z in one direction and here in opposite, and they can kind of contradict each other. Well, not completely contradict, uh, but if you multiply these two, you get this equation. So basically, the radius of detector should be 100,000 times more than the uh, particle size. And that gives you huge difference in area. And that means that if you want then to measure this extinction cross-section within 1%, then single to noise ratio should be, well, larger than 12 orders of magnitude. So that's huge. If you have a diffusing particle with a displacement, typical displacement of uh, around uh, one-tenth, then, well, it's a bit better. And, that's well, time, you yeah. see 1% one, 1 yes. Uh, one percent is almost impossible. So then you go to like ten percent, and you have 
1 million and 10,000 signal to noise ratio. So that uh, can be doable. And so with that, I conclude. So what I wanted to show is that uh, measuring extinction of single particles with a single detector is very hard. Uh, random particle movement helps, but not as much as for a collection of, of particles and possible improvements. I mean, I'm not a specialist in that, it's just some wild thoughts, but some of them I think were already discussed at this conference, uh, like using multiple detectors, uh, particle flying through detector area instead of random walk, or probably some beam shaping can help. But all of this require careful analysis similar to what uh, I, I have done here. And uh, to finish, so I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, Michael Mishenko, because he was uh, like one of the first who started this quantitative uh, analysis of uh, this issue. And also uh, we discussed uh, some preliminary results with him and he motivated me to actually finish this research, was always uh, encouraging in this respect. Uh, unfortunately, I could not show the final results um, to, to him. And well, frankly speaking, it's not completely finished yet, but still, uh, here it is, and I thank the Russian Science Foundation for funding. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maxim. Uh, this was a very nice way of remembering Michael. Uh, we do not have any time. If you have any questions to Maxim, please uh, use chat or directly send a note to him. Um, uh, Oleg, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, why don't you start then? Okay. Working with Michael as well, and you all know Oleg. Just... Please share your slides, Oleg. You have 15 minutes. I will warn you two minutes before the time is up, okay? Okay. Yes, and uh, in my presentation, I'll be talking of our joint work uh, with Michael and also Ping Yang on uh, trying to uh, propose a, a model for simulating light scattering by non-spherical particles. And here I would say that um, I was lucky to have pretty warm friendship with Michael, and that friendship started from this work. At the same time, this work itself, it's kind of nice achievements in my scientific career. Uh, and, um, and uh, well, I don't know why it doesn't advance. Ah, and, uh, well, the results of this work were published at, at least in these two papers. And uh, uh, they become quite popular. And here, just a quick, as a quick illustration, I put number of citations which we have at present, which for one of paper, over a thousand. And, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, in the middle of 70s, when I started to work actually at NASA, Michael came, came out with a pretty efficient approach for calculating uh, light scattering by randomly oriented spheroids. And he illustrated that this uh, apparently rather simple uh, model of non-spherical particles capture pretty well uh, some uh, at least qualitative uh, <coughs> features of uh, scattering by non-spherical particles, for example, lightning phase function. And this, uh, his work attracted a lot of attention. And, uh, I, and I also start uh, to try and, uh, to use this work. For example, I was working on the Ironet retrieval. And uh, as a part of evaluation of accuracy of uh, uh, retrieval that existed at that time, I tried to make as as realistic as possible synthetic measurements and then invert them with existing code and analyze uh, 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 accuracy and, and, identi and to identify problem. And um, uh, this is a summary actually of this study which was published in the year 2000. And on the bottom you could see that uh, one of the biggest artifacts which uh, showed this study is this um, uh, artificial, very strong fine mode inside distribution and artificial spectral dependence in the real part of the refractive index. And uh, it was uh, absorbed for non spherical particles calculated based on spheroids. But what was uh, most uh, interesting that in real 
retrieval, we saw exactly the same thing. So that gave me an idea. So actually, the, the approach which Michael proposed, apparently pretty close to the reality. And then, evidently, I tried to use uh, the developments of Michael in our retrieval. And his code at that time was one of most advanced uh, uh, code providing like exact solution for light scattering by randomly oriented spheroids. He in, in, in realized analytical integration or orientation. It had a good speed and was providing calculation for other large particles with side parameter uh, around uh, 60. Uh, uh, 60. At the same time, the speed was still uh, not sufficient for direct retrieval, and therefore we try. I, I we try to use uh, the same approach as we used even for miscatering, uh, where we knew that main uh, uh, calculation times goes for integration over sizes, and in that sense, there is very simple practical approach here. If you look at size distribution, like if you represent continuous function on the left by some superposition of rectangles, we kind of can uh, put the value, the concentration out of integral, and we simply can calculate once this um, integral coefficient, develop lookup table, and then use them very quickly in calculation. This is what we try to do with spheroids. However, we did it, uh, well, at the same time, we did it a bit more complex way. We didn't use rectangle, we used triangles. Here you could see it's a trapezoidal approximation. Here you could see that any size distribution can be represented by this approximation. And the approach was proposed, shown to me, and we tried to use this, this approach. There is, of course, even more accurate approximation, which is quadratic, but we uh, used uh, this trapezoidal approach. Trapezoidal approximation, uh, because it was practically quite reliable. And we uh, try to simulate uh, these uh, kernels. However, uh, although Michael code was quite advantageous, uh, I mean advanced, it has also limitation. For example, well, it didn't run for the size parameter higher than 60 and even for an uh, had limits in aspect ratio and even for smaller particles it still was like 100 times slower than them. Me calculation. So basically, calculating these kernels was not uh, possible using only Michael code. And here we start to work uh, uh, together with Ping Yang, who was also developing at that time quite uh, efficient and universal uh, approaches. For example, here I put just two publication. For example, the first one, finite difference time domain scheme, was universal but evidently slow and hard to use in practical for our purposes. But the geometrical optic, optics integral equation was actually something what we needed because it was working in the uh, for the parameters where T matrix was not working as good uh, as we wished. And Ping actually mentioned already this uh, work in his presentation. And what we did when we calculated our kernels, we basically uh, ran a Michael T matrix code as far as we could, and then we complemented by uh, Ping Yan and Kunun Liao uh, code calculations. And as you could see, we could uh, cover all uh, a range of size parameters. And we end up to build these nice uh, kernels of lookup tables in, for pretty wide uh, range of size parameters and complex refractive index. And as a result, we can put uh, like size distribution and any uh, distribution of um, axis ratio and calculate all optical properties, including full scattering matrix. And uh, we pu put up this uh, uh, kernels in quite convenient software which could be integrated in any other codes and for example I integrated in my inversion code and uh, with that I could invert full phase matrix and here you could see what it could give uh, we applied it to invert uh, data obtained by Hessler Walter and Olga Munis uh, laboratory measurements and here inverting full phase matrix we could get 
complex refractive index size distribution and also shape distribution here on the bottom you could see that for this uh, water suspension particles we could get we could see that the uh, shape distribution is purely spherical and uh, uh, we also use this inversion tool as a inversion algorithm as a tool to analyze and check how well spheroid may reproduce scattering by real non-spherical dust and we uh, inverted several most reliable measurements by Hester and Olga for Feldspar and we actually got a pretty nice fit at least with such uh, a simple model and I'm not sure if there are any better fit even by now and we could retrieve a size distribution which was also measured in a, in a, in situ and agree well with those measurements at the same time we found that if we retrieve axis ratio we surely we are getting there are no spherical particles but shape of axis ratio was kind of uh, unstable so we thought we found that there is some non-uniqueness say uh, in sense that even our spheroid model would be more complex than uh, more complex than needed so we uh, assume that we have same number of prolate and ablate particles and then inversion stabilized and feed remained as good as it is so somewhere we got a, a model of desert dust based on spheroids which uh, we would think that it's very close to reality so we could not only use it somewhere but also play and look how actually different aspects of light scattering by non-spherical particle look like and here you could see just some simple simulation but they're quite insightful for example this is for fine mode aerosol comparison spheres and spheroids for monomodal size distribution fine mode different refractive index as you could see as expected for small particles they're nearly the same so non-sphericity doesn't play much role here for large particles, we see not notable differences. Evidently, the phase function become flat. Uh, some features, uh, uh, angular features disappear, and that's also what we expected. But we could look not only in intensity, even in polarization. And here I have to mention that one of patients of Michael was actually promoting an uh, uh, the usefulness of polarimetric observation for monitoring aerosol uh, for example i mentioned i would uh, relay, uh, cite this part this um, paper and here i would like to mention uh, well the basis for that was pretty clear for example if you look compare measurements of single view radiometers such for passive radiometers such as MODIS we see only one point and phase function at one wavelength but if you look at measurements of multi-angular polarimeter in addition that we see a, a range pretty wide range of uh, scattering angular phase function we see also degree of linear polarization evidently sensitivity should be high so there is no doubt uh, that uh, here Michael with an um, was completely right promoting multi-angular uh, polarimetric observation and here i would like to mention that he was very active and uh, i would like to acknowledge well like ping already did and uh, ping yang already mentioned that that uh, well michael was very patient about science and uh, promoting his ideas and for example he played one of key role in organizing this Apollo workshop which now become regular we had one in um, uh, China and then we had one in France in Lille next one we hope to have in Washington DC uh, in uh, spring 2022 uh, well hoping that situation will allow us and uh, also I would like to mention that as a part of award on this uh, Apollo um, workshop we also established a award for the achievements in polarimetric remote sensing and michael received uh, this award in 2019 which was he really deserved unfortunately he couldn't participate and brian was receiving his award anyway mention this patient of michael for polarization i also wanted to say that uh, developing this uh, spheroidal model or looking in detail we actually we are finding that 
the polarization is useful, but we also were discovering new challenges, which Michael maybe not necessarily acknowledged, although I always draw his attention to that, but he never disputed. For example, here it's a degree of linear polarization for spheres and spheroids, fine particles. Well, the, uh, one of the uh, aspects where polarization should help it's actually sensitivity to real part of refractive index. And indeed, you see here that uh, the all curves are well separated, especially for spherical particles, for spheroidal also, although this angular dependence changes, so you need actually to control somehow shape rather accurately. But sensitivity is there, which is uh, not as strong in intensity only. However, when we go for large particles, we see the sensitivity of uh, spherical scattering to refractive index is really strong, while for spheroids it's almost gone. So the, the message is that polarization may be not as helpful for non-spherical particles as for spherical particles. At the same time, as you could compare left and right, it's very sensitive to the shape. So that's a uh, well, uh, message indicating that uh, going along the um, uh, uh, using polarimetric data it's promising, but also maybe not as easy, but as we considered at the beginning. Well, especially when Michael did his calculation using spherical particles. Uh, and uh, me, as a person who working with the retrieval, facing that. Well, another. Uh, 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 Oleg, your time is up. Ah, uh, okay. Well, ba basically, I wanted to show that spheroids also provide good insight on um, uh, uh, modeling LiDAR scattering for LiDAR ratio and also depolarization. And, uh, well, I go to its conclusion that this work provided convenient tool and uh, showed that uh, spheroid approximation quite powerful, maybe even more powerful than uh, it was expected. We developed also tool which publicly available and now used widely in diverse applications. And well, we're looking for the evolu evolution, for example, super spheroid, but I can tell you it's not easy. It will be not easy task to improve this model. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Oleg. It was really nice to remember all the accomplishments he had and uh, all the contributions he had to the community, including his work with you and your colleagues. Thank you very much for this overview. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Pina. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we will go to... Uh, Sorry. Uh, uh, I'm Adrian. Uh, I think that I can... I solve the problem with my computer. I change it with my son. Uh, uh, Is it possible to give the talk? Yes, you, you will do, but you, let's put you at the end of the, the presentations. Okay, okay. Of the procedure. Thank you. Thank you, though. Okay. So we will go to Dr. Dulukac. Are you here? Yes. Okay. Please start. You have 15 minutes. I will turn my video off and then on just two minutes before your Time is up. Can I start? Yes, please. Good evening, good evening, good uh, afternoon to all. A few years ago, we discussed uh, the problem considered in this presentation with Michael, but uh, postponed this work for the future. Perhaps it would have become one more our study in a long series of our works uh, done within the framework of our 30 years collaboration, which began when Michael uh, was still working in Ukraine. But life made its tragical changes. So it is widely recognized that uh, carbonaceous uh, particles uh, <clears throat> Carbonaceous particles represent a wide type of uh, atmospheric aerosols. By now, numerical modeling of uh, optical properties 
for various uh, morphology of such particles has been carried out, and in particular for compound uh, aerosols composed of different configurations of uh, suit uh, spherical cores uh, coated in different ways by sulfate uh, spherical shells. However, uh, scattering properties for non-spherical compound particles, in particular for spheroidal compound particles, uh, composed of spheroidal suit core coated by spheroidal sulfate uh, shell are practically not down, uh, not studied. So our main objective is to perform a theoretical analysis of scattering and absorption properties of fully dispersed suit sulfate spheroidal aerosols of different effective size and degree of non sphericity also including the spectral dependence. And this figure shows the shapes of considered particles. As usually we suppose that spheroids are randomly oriented and uh, <coughs> form a statistically isotropic and uh, mirosymmetric particle group. In this uh, case, uh, the uh, stock scattering, normal stock scattering matrix has such a uh, well known uh, <coughs> form. In this presentation, we will uh, focus our attention on the discussion of the behavior of integral uh, scattering characteristics, uh, integral characteristics such as uh, uh, ensemble average absorption cross section absorption uh, angstrom exponent and backscattering linear depolarization ratio. It should be noted that uh, these quantities are often used in characterization of uh, aerosols. And also to make our study more representative and to suppress the effects of uh, resonance, which are typical of monodispersed scatters, we use uh, size averaging of, of characteristics uh, by using the uh, standard power law size distribution. So in our computations, we used, used the four-term T-matrix code for randomly oriented coated scatters developed by Corentes, but with our corrections. And it should be noted that this code it can be used only in the case of uh, non-absorbent uh, content. Our computations were performed for such wavelengths, which correspond to spectral channels that are used in uh, measurements of the backscattering leader uh, depolarization ratio by uh, backscattering radars. And we consider two values of the suit volume fraction, uh, namely 7 and 15 percent. Volume equals the effective radius of the suit core we consider to be 0 0.1, 0 0.15, and 0 0.2 micrometers. And size of region was uh, carried out applying a Gaussian quadrature formula with 25 quadrature points. And the uh, effective variance in the size uh, distribution was equal to 0 0.1. And mostly we perform computations for oblate spheroids with a uh, ratio in the range of 1.1, 1.5. But uh, for, and uh, we um, use the same excess ratio also for both for uh, the core and the shell. But for comparison, we also consider the case of prolet spheroids with uh, core radius equal 0 0.5 micrometers and such excel ratio, which correspond to oblate spheroids with aspect ratio equal 1.5. And this table gives the spectral values of the refractive indices for soot and sulfides and sulfates, which we used. And this table shows the uh, values of uh, the effective radius of the core, effective radius of the shell, which correspond to uh, um, suit, uh, suit uh, 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 
we wrote seven percent and fifteen percent, and these are the range of liquid version. And now we show uh, show some results of our computations, and we should must note that now we will not compare our results with the results obtained by other uh, authors for uh, another particle morphology. So in this uh, slide, we show the uh, excess ratio dependencies of the absorption cross section. Uh, the uh, top row, row uh, corresponds to a wavelength equal 0 0.355, middle row to wavelength 0 0.532 micrometers, and the bottom row corresponds to wavelength equal 1.0. Uh, 0.65 micrometers, and the left hand uh, <coughs> column uh, shows the results obtained for uh, radius, for, for radius equal 0 0.1 micrometers, middle 0. Point, uh, radius, uh, for radius 0 0.15 micrometers, and uh, this row for uh, radius equal 0 0.5 micrometers. And the uh, uh, red uh, lines correspond to the uh, case of the suit uh, volume fraction equal uh, 7%, and the uh, blue line for suit uh, volume fraction equal 15%. First of all, we see a very weak dependence of the absorption cross section on particle non sphericity. And it should be noted that uh, such a weak dependence is also typical of homogeneous spheroids. Also, we see that the dependence somewhat slightly increases with increasing uh, size of the spheroids. And it is uh, somewhat in uh, the values of absorption enhancement also in increase with increasing size. Also, the, these values decrease with increasing wavelength, and uh, the values of absorption cross section decrease with decreasing the uh, size of shell. This uh, slide shows the uh, ratio dependencies of the absorption and strong exponent. Uh, the two pro um, correspond to the wave, two pair of wavelengths, uh, 0 0.355, 0 0.532 micrometers. Middle row to corresponds to 0 0.355, 1.064 micrometers, and the uh, uh, bottom row to the pair of wavelengths uh, of 0 0.532, 1. 064 micrometers. Again, we see a very slow, uh, slight dependence of the absorption answering exponent on uh, uh, particle non sphericity. This uh, uh, dependence slightly increases with increasing radius, but the values of, of absorption angstrom exponent decreased with in, uh, increasing radius. And we see that in this case, these values are negative, and uh, this fact can be explained by the fact that in this case, the uh, absorption cross sections increases with increasing uh, wavelength. Also, uh, we can see that the values of Armstrong, of absorption Armstrong exponent, are very sensitive to the choice of wavelengths. And the uh, values of angstrom, of absorption angstrom exponent are in sufficiently uh, wide range of values. And this figure shows the... Your time is about to end. The, uh, okay, this figure shows the dependencies of linear depolarization ratio. We see a very uh, a strong dependence of linear depolarization ratio on particle non sphericity, also the values increase with increasing uh, size and increase with uh, uh, and uh, uh, decrease with increasing wave length. 
and in all cases that the values of linear depolarization ratio are larger, uh, increased with uh, increasing uh, surface shell. And this figure shows the wave dependencies of the linear depolarization ratio. This row is for such uh, uh, for such aspect ratio, and the, here the such aspect ratio. And green uh, lines show the case of proid spheroids. We see that in the case of proid spheroids, the values of linear depolarization ratio are larger uh, compared to the case of oblate spheroids, and this is um, uh, also typical for homogeneous spheroids. And uh, these two slides show the dependencies, uh, scattering and dependencies of all um, elements of the stock scattering matrix. And we can conclude that uh, behavior of all elements of the scattering uh, matrix, uh, uh, dependence on particle shape increases with increasing radius, uh, uh, radius of suit and uh, shell. And uh, in summary, we can uh, conclude that our numerical results may be uh, used in the uh, estimation of applicability of such simple model of particle morphology to, uh, to, to its applicability in order to use such model for interpretation of existing experiments. And maybe this model may be included, incorporated in existing uh, uh, retrieval uh, algorithms may be in grasp. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Zana. Um, uh, it was nice work. Uh, we don't have time to uh, for the uh, questions, but if there will be any question on the chat, please answer. Uh, we will go to the next speaker, Phil, Phil Marston. Phil, are you there? Zana, can, you can turn off your presentation. Okay. Yeah, Phil. Yes. Okay. Okay. And let's see. Let me, if I, I'm still setting this up. There we go. So uh, I assume that you can see my slide. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, so I'm, I'm going to... Uh, share with you some some results about uh, something that I started with Michael many years ago, and very frankly, I forgot about it. And uh, um, so that will become evident later on. Let's see. I need to. I'm just trying to do an adjustment on my computer here. Excuse me, one moment. There we go. Okay. So this is an unfinished collaboration it was an out outgrowth of michael's renowned scientific hospitality and networking and uh, i first saw that at the september 1998 els meeting at nasa gist that uh, he helped to organize and though this picture is not from that meeting it kind of reminds me from when i when i first met him at that meeting and i'm going to need to do some review for a broader audience. And so let's see, I'm trying to get some of these things out of the way, excuse me. So uh, on caustics from spheroidal droplets, and then we'll see that this, this will meet Michael's interest in non-spherical particle scattering. So to begin with, I'm going to go back to work in the 1970s. I did as a postdoc at Yale, where I looked at light scattering for, uh, oscillating spheroidal drops that were illuminated along their symmetry axis. And in those experiments, we observed the uh, Mobius shift. Then in 1984, I, I worked with my friend Eugene Tren, where we took acoustic levitation again, and in this case, illuminated uh, the drop horizontally with a vertical symmetry axis and looked at uh, the evolution of the light scattering. It's a function of the drop shape, uh, producing the patterns shown 
On the right, where D over H is the aspect ratio of the drop. And we've got John Nye interested in the problem who supplied some of the initial theory. And then there was a lot of developments in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, this is one of them from um, 1991. Can you hear me? And uh, this is for, for white light illumination. Okay, so then one other development in the pre-1998 part was uh, Richard Chang's group. Um, I presented these prior results in 1993 at a colloquium at Yale to Richard's group. And uh, he became very interested in using what he called uh, two-dimensional angular optical scattering, which in effect these results are, but applying them to aerosol sized particles and started out trying to use some T matrix calculations. And perhaps some of these people are here could comment on these, but uh, see some of what we're interested in, but was only able to do a very limited size. Okay, so now I'm going to look at part two involving uh, Mashenko's interest. And uh, these have, largely been addressed by others, but I'm just going to give an example from this 1995 collaboration on uh, combining non-spherical particles in T-matrix results. And then uh, this is from the, the lower part is from the proceedings of the uh, 1998 conference I referred to earlier, and Michael probably wrote this, and you can, you can look that up, which I think reflects his enthusiasm about this general topic. So for that proceedings, um, I wrote up the talk that I presented there in a summary form. And uh, one of the uh, things that I mentioned in that write-up was that you might be able to see some of these interesting caustics for much smaller drops than in the experiments, which were millimeter size. Because if you do a me scattering calculation for spheres, you find that you can uh, see the rainbow for with, with the appropriate polarization for Ka as small as 50. So that's getting into the range uh, in which the T matrix is applicable. So in 1999, I wrote Michael uh, asking him whether or not uh, he could carry out uh, T matrix calculations and see this hyperbolic umbilic V, I'll refer to later, benchmark caustic. And I also mentioned Richard Chang's group, uh, results in that email. And he replied immediately with the email shown below uh, that he was very interested in doing that if I provided the parameters. So uh, there was an exchange of emails, which I won't show you, but then in November, he wrote me with uh, that he'd got these results of Ka of 140 and why they were difficult. We'll get back to that a little bit later, but it, but it turns out there was, uh, he had extremely fine angular range to resolve all the fine structure. Um, and again, this uh, 140 was the largest convergence he could get at that time. And uh, I acknowledge the receipt of that FedEx package on November 6th of that uh, 1999. But um, for, for somewhat unknown reasons, um, I didn't have time to pursue it other than the fact that I was very busy in my own program. Okay, and, and we only had a couple more emails, one of them being ab about this. One of these uh, is in preparation to a, a visit uh, to New York where I uh, met him in his office and we talked for a while. Um, but actually, I frankly forgot about them. And it, and it wasn't until March of this year where I was trying to remember if there's something unfinished that uh, I convinced myself there was by getting looking at my old email. I had to get a 20 year old computer working to find the email. And the hard part also was finding the FedEx package. Um, but I was able to do that. So let's look at his results. These results have never been made public previously. Now, before we do that, something about the uh, context. Uh, the re relative refractive index was taken to be 1.332, representative of uh, visible light for water drops. Uh, the largest, well, the Ka up ran was 140, and that would turn out to be about 11 micron drop. 
uh, and um, the aspect ratios be considered are listed here. I'll show them again later with a fine uh, step size. And then um, I've inferred the polarization from um, the comparison with the sphere results he sent as e the illumination is E field perpendicular to the plane of the equator and he's plotting the total far field intensity. Just to remind you what happens in the ray theory from things that I had worked out in the 1980s and uh, early 90s was that um, in the hyperbolic umbilic focal section region, you get this V-shaped caustic. Uh, the angle here is psi as indicated, and that gets shoved out to infinity when you're at the particular critical aspect ratio of the drop and because we're observing and calculating far field scattering. So here is a scan of his results. He didn't give me the files. He just sent me the uh, printouts. So uh, he's labeled the uh, aspect ratios as indicated and also the angular range shown with a uh, linear mapping on position. And so I'll make these easier to see in the next slide in the upper left, what I've done is I've taken that scan and used software to enhance the contrast. So for the sphere case, you can see the uh, airy caustic and the associated fine structure from the other rays, that is the other than the two chord rays, interfering with that. And then um, if you look at the lower part here, at uh, 1.3, uh, one one, you could that's a hyperbolic umbilic focal section. You can see the V-shaped caustic. But one of the things that you can't see is unlike the experimental results for large drops on the right, which are uh, Ka of about 50 times larger, those uh, in those results, the um, cusp caustic is distinct from the airy caustic. Um, that is not the case in the T-matrix results for the small uh, drops. But the hyperbolic umbilic was in fact the brightest feature in his results. And then furthermore, um, this question of the V angle. So the uh, physical optics theory, which is a combination of both the geometrical optics, which gives you the uh, what are called asymptotic result of, for high sizes of 42.1 degrees. And then you can go in and, and color the wave field using physical optics. Uh, these are the results of calculations and the observed pattern uh, that were published uh, in my 1992 review article. But um, <clears throat> you can see immediately that uh, Michael's results of the focal section uh, uh, aren't in that asymptotic regime. Even though they have some of the V-shaped features, some of the other details are clearly different than the form that's predicted. So uh, that says that uh, Ka of 140 is not sufficient. And this is uh, one of the ways I used to measure the angle. Um, we can go back to this later if there's questions, but this is the summary of the physical optics calculation. Now, let's look at some subsequent developments. Um, in 2008, uh, Oli Joby did a master's thesis in my program where she was observed the uh, hyperbolic umbilic focal section with tilted illumination. And we also modeled aspects of that, and we published that in JQSRT subsequently. And then in 2010, uh, Jim Locke and collaborator did a device series expansion that also shows, again, some aspects of what we've just seen from Michael's results. And then um, in 2013 to the present, there's been various groups that have done experiments with large spherical drops, including Darmstadt and Marseille. And also various groups have done computational vector ray tracing that confirms and extends uh, the prior results that were worked out between 1984 and 1998. Now, here's a selected summary of Michael's results that, uh, again, the hyperbolic umbilic focal section was the brightest feature in the T-matrix result. Uh, the V-shaped caustic is visible. The V-angle is greater than the asymptotic ray theory prediction. 
and the details of diffraction pattern differ from that asymptotic theory. In other aspects, the rainbow arc is not distinct from the cusp caustic, unlike the large drop data. And the uh, <clears throat> aspect ratio, DO ratio one, it turns out to agree with me theory. So uh, again, this is a uh, the comparison slide I showed you earlier. And uh, as under special discussion here, again, these results came about through Michael's scientific hospitality. And I apologize to Michael's family for having forgotten about his results for nearly two decades. In fact, when I gave an invited talk related to these aspects of things at the 2017 meeting, again, I totally forgot about these. And Michael had to step out of the room during the talk. So he, he's never mentioned them probably because he didn't want to embarrass me. Uh, if you want more information, uh, <clears throat> the T-matrix code he used was probably that of Mashenko and Travis, 1998, because in the FedEx was a reprint of his article. And uh, <clears throat> the relevant physical optics can be found in this uh, review article summarized from other papers. And um, finally, the color pictures, which are not in the OSA uh, online version, I put on the ResearchGate site. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Phil. This was a very nice story. It was very uh, revealing. And thank you for sharing this here. I, I do hope to, to write these results up so they're archived. Yeah, I think it will be really nice to see them on in print. Thank you very much. And um, now we will come to our uh, last presentation. I think, uh, uh, Adrian, are you there now? Uh, yes. OK, now we would like to. Uh, Phil, can you? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Sorry. Um, let's see. Can you tell me? I'm, I'm at the share button. Ah, stop share. I just found it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. And uh, Jim, uh, you can now share your slides. You have 15 minutes, Adrian. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, my talk, Electromagnetic Scattering by Discrete Random Media, is uh, dedicated to the memory of Mikhail Mishenko, beautiful mind and a brilliant scientist. During the years, we had a fruitful collaboration, which results in a series of 12 papers on this topic. My intention is to give a short overview of our research. In a series of three papers, we analyzed several methods for deriving the radiative transfer equation. For a discrete random layer with a sparse concentration of particles. The goal of was to explain the radiative transfer theory from the Maxwell equation. For sparse media, we use the following the standard assumptions, according to which the position of the particles are uncorrelated, the spatial distribution of the particle is statistically uniform, and each particle is located in the far field region of all the other particles. In the first paper, we consider the approach used previously by uh, Mikhail. So the solution method is based on the far foldy equation, an order of scattering expansion for the total field derived under the Tversky approximation, and the latter approximation for, co for the coherency dyadic. Actually, we derive an integral equation for the diffuse specific coherency dyadic and the vector radiative transfer equation for the diffuse specific intensity column vector. However, in this paper, new results were established. For example, we derived the coherent field for inhomogeneous media and multiple species of particles. We discussed the continuous extension of the far field representation to the near field. We discussed the Foldy approximation and its corollaries. We derived the Foldy integral equation for the coherent field, as well as the scalar radiative transfer equation. In the second paper, we intended to move the far field assumption in the latest stage of our derivation. Starting from the vector integral for the equation and the Tversky approximation, actually we derive the Dyson equation for the coherent field and the latter approximated Bess-Alpeter equation for the dyadic correlation function. Finally, under the far field assumption, the Dyson equation was reduced to the for the integral equation for the coherent field, and the vector radiative transfer equation was obtained from the iterated solution of the Bess-Alpeter equation. 
the effect of random rough boundaries was analyzed in a third paper. For this purpose, we considered spherical particles distributed in a layer with scattering boundaries. The solution method was based on the best salpeter equation for the dyadic correlation function and the Wiener Fourier transform method for the best salpeter equation. Because the solution method is somehow special, the assumptions are also special. In particular, we assume that the fluctuation of the discrete random medium and the rough surface are statistically independent and homogeneous. The problem is translationally invariant and isotropic in azimuth. We employ the effective field approximation, the ladder approximation for the scattering intensity operator and the on-shell approximation for its Fourier transform, as well as a weak surface correlation approximation. However, the main results was that if the layer has non-scattering boundaries, the main assumption are the effective field approximation and the on-shell approximation. And this ap uh, approximation are compatible with the sparse media assumption, uh, namely uncorrelated particle position, far field approximation, and the Tversky approximation. The conclusion of our analysis in these three papers was also the radiative transfer equation for sparse media can be derived by different methods they operate with the same assumption, namely uncorrelated particle position, far field approximation, and the Tversky approximation. Because in the previous paper, the boundary condition uh, had a formal representation in terms of the reflection and transmission operators, in a forthcoming paper, we use the modified version of the Tversky approximation for a scattering system consisting of a group of particles and the rough surface to derive the boundary condition for the specific coherency dyadic at a rough interface and to show that the reflection and transmission matrices obtained by this approach are identical to those obtained by applying a phenomenological approach based on a facet model, in particular the Cox-Monk Cox model. In a series of four papers, we analyzed, we considered more complex, uh, a more complex problem, namely the scattering by a discrete random layer with dense and sparse concentration of particles. For this purpose, we considered spherical particles and the plan electromagnetic wave at oblique incident. The analyze was focused on the derivation of the dispersion equation for the effective wave number, of the coherent field inside and outside the scattering medium, and of a radiative transfer equation for dense media. We also analyzed the incoherent and coherent by scattering in the backward region. The solution method was a superposition key matrix uh, method based on spherical statistics. The derivation of the dispersion equation presents some peculiarities because we consider a layer of uh, particles. We start with the last lax integral equation for the conditional uh, configuration average extinction field coefficient, written as a linear combination of uh, coefficient corresponding to an upgoing and a downgoing wave. And then by balancing waves with different propagation direction and wave numbers, we derive two homogeneous system of equation corresponding to the generalized lorentz lorentz law which reduced to a single homogeneous system of equation corresponding to a semi-infinite discrete random medium at normal incident, and two inhomogeneous system of equation corresponding to the general eva uh, ozen extinction theorem, which can be reduced to two scalar equation by means of the addition theorem for vector spherical harmonics. Coming to the coherent field, we assume a special form solution for the conditional configuration average exciting field coefficient. Computed the zero order field, zero order field. This means that we neglect uh, any boundary effects. In fact, we computed the coherent fields reflected and transmitted by the layer and the coherent field inside the layer. We analyze the full fulfillment of the boundary condition for the electric field at the layer interface. We consider the particular cases of normal incidents and the same infinite discrete random medium. And we presented a self-consistent derivation of the coherent field for sparse media and the Tversky and Foldy approximation. We derive the vector radiative transfer equation for an, with an additional source term, typically of uh, dense media. For doing this, we derive first an integral equation for the correlation matrix of the side field coefficient and an integral representation for the specific coherency dyadic in terms of this matrix. Then by employing a series of approximation, we obtain a simplified integral representation for the specific coherency dyadic and finally derive the radiative transfer equation. The analysis of the coherent backscattering was performed in the linear polarization bodies. In particular, we derive the cross-reflection matrix for a layer with densely and sparsely distributed particles. We design approximate methods for computing the ladder and cross-reflection matrices in the case of semi-infinite medium with a sparse distribution of particles. 
We established the relation between the element of the ladder and cross reflection matrices in the exact backscattering direction for dense and sparse media. And we develop practical algorithms for solving the underlying integral equation by the method of Picard iteration and the discrete ordinate method. In the previous paper, the analysis was focused on a plan wave illumination. In a series of two papers, we analyzed electromagnetic scattering by a discrete random medium illuminated by a Gaussian beam. The analysis was, was focused on the derivation of the radiative transfer equation and the design of numerical methods for solving the radiative transfer equation. To derive the radiative transfer equation, we use the following computational steps. We derived first a plan wave spectrum representation for a Gaussian beam using the Davis approximation for the vector potential. We established an integral representation for the coherent field over transverse waves. We extended the Tversky approximation to a Gaussian beam illumination. We analyzed the far field scattering of a particle excited by the coherent field. And finally, derived the vector radiative transfer equation. Important here is that we show that the traditional radiative transfer equation based on, on a phenomenology, phenomenological approach correspond to a weakly focused Gaussian beam. The scalar radiative transfer equation was solved by using the Fourier transfer method for the horizontal variables and the discrete ordinate method with matrix exponential for solving the one dimensional radiative transfer equation in the wave number domain. In particular, we treated the problem of a Gaussian beam at oblique and normal incident and a very interesting problem in radiative transfer, the search rate problem. In this case, the diffuse intensity was separated into a single and a multiple scattering component, where the single scattering component, which is uh, 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 was computed analytically, and the multiple scattering component uh, numerically. So actually the main goal of our research which as I said, uh, uh, we published 12 papers about this, was to explain the radiative transfer theory from the macroscopic Maxwell equations. But moreover, our intention was to derive new trans tra transport equation, new radiative transfer equations for dense media, coherent backscattering, Gaussian beam illumination, and stochastic media. Important is here to note that this new radiative transfer equation, this new transport equation, can be solved by standard methods using the radiative transfer theory. Uh, what we have to do is to use uh, only a Picard iteration method in conjunction, for instance, with the discrete ordinate method. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Andrea. This, uh, Adria, this was very nice. And I think. Um, uh your work uh hope i hope it will continue because this was very nice and i wish uh, michael were around us to continue this work yes well, actually uh, uh, our plan was to write a book on this topic uh, i think that uh, i will finish this project and dedicate this book to mikhail mishenko as a okay. sign of my gratitude. He was an unbelievable scientist with an extraordinary uh, physical intuition. I would compare him with Butterman. It was really extraordinary as a scientist. An unbelievable physical intuition and uh, physical feeling. Uh, in our work, he always told me, Adrian, you should prove this because this has a physical sense. Not this, this is wrong. And this, for a theoretician, this is very helpful. If you know the, where you should come. And this was Mikhail Mishenko. He always knows, from, from this physical uh, intuition, he knows exactly what, how to organize a proof. How the mathematics can help to explain physical phenomena. Okay. Thank you, Adrian. Okay. These were uh, really uh, deep words, and I think uh, you described his soul very nicely.